Okay, so uh, Curtis, I think I'll start off with a, a short bio and then uh, lead into your talk. Sounds great. Okay, why don't we get going? Can everyone hear me okay? This is Mike Russell talking. Yes. I think so, okay. Uh, well, welcome to Curtis Johnson's uh, PhD defense. Um, this is very exciting that we have so many people here and uh, we appreciate your attendance. Uh, a little bit about Curtis. Curtis grew up in Northwest Washington State, uh, quite a ways north of Seattle. Um, he did his undergrad in geology at the University of Idaho, graduating, I think, around 2013. Um, and it was around 2012 or 2013 that I first met Curtis. He had contacted me while I worked at Newmont. Uh, he let me know that he had gotten news that he was accepted for an internship at the Leeville Underground Mine in the Carlin Trend, and that he wanted to do a study of the relationship of dikes uh, to Carlin type gold mineralization. And little did I know at that time that I would be uh, working with this guy pretty closely for the next uh, eight years. Um, so it's been a good experience. Um, after completing his undergrad, um, Curtis went to study uh, with John Dillis at OSU. His MS thesis was on the igneous petrology of the immigrant pass volcanic field, which flanks the Carlin trend and is the same age as the big gold deposits there. That work included mapping a good part of a quadrangle, and both Chris Henry and I served on Curtis's master's committee. Uh, following that, Curtis got married. Uh, he moved to and uh, may have honeymooned in Winnemucca, Nevada, and <laughs> uh, for Newmont at the Phoenix Mine in the Battle Mountain area. Uh, he was there for over three years. He stayed in nearly constant communication with me. Uh, he would email me at 4 a.m. on his morning bus rides into the mine. Uh, tell me about his thoughts on what he thought controlled Nevada's giant gold deposits. In the fall of 2017, only two and a half years ago, uh, Curtis enrolled at the Mackey School of Mines uh, for his PhD program. Uh, he wrote his own proposal on the topic of Eocene metallogeny of, northern, of the Northern Great Basin. Um, and this was funded through the Center for Research and Economic Geology and John Lentine at UNR. Uh, this project uh, was also heavily funded by Newmont and Curtis received many scholarships, including the prestigious Copper Club Lord Bagri Scholarship, two Society of Economic Geology Awards and one award through the Geological Society of Nevada, among others. Uh, through all of this uh, scholastic and industry experience Curtis has uh, with his wonderful wife Alex raised a young family including two beautiful daughters and over the past year he's been working nearly full-time as the Idaho Montana Exploration Manager for Bronco Creek Exploration. One might ask how how Curtis has managed to do all these things and uh, I've always said that Curtis's day is different than most of us um, I think it, his day consists of something more than 24 hours. So with that, I'll, I'll let Curtis begin his dissertation defense. And um, uh, we'll mute, mute everybody. Uh, I think you're already muted. Um, you'll remain muted until the end of uh, Curtis's presentation, at which time there should be a little icon that pops up at the bottom of your screen, which is the raise hand icon. And if you want to ask a question, then uh, just depress that button, and uh, we should be able to take you in order that you uh, that you raise your hand. So, with that, Curtis, you want to begin? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. It's pretty amazing. We've been working on this for a good eight years now. Um, it's funny you bring out my honeymoon. Actually, we uh, my honeymoon was eight weeks of mapping at Immigrant Pass Volcanics with my wife as my field assistant. So. Um, she won't let me live that one down for a while. Um, okay, so uh, we've got quite a bit loaded up here. Uh, and there's a bunch that, as with any dissertation defense, you can't really cover it all. Um, so I urge you when, when we get this uh, published and out the door to, to take a look, because there is quite a bit more in there. We're really going to focus on two parts, um, and I'll share my screen in just a second. But really, uh, 
Phoenix Fortitude, uh, where I spent a number of years just really mapping and sampling and trying to understand it in detail. Um, so we'll talk about that and then uh, looking at the regional ESC story. So I'll go ahead and share a screen here in just one second. Okay, how's that look, Mike? Looks like your desktop. All right. It's country. Oh. Do we have the presentation yet? Yes, it's up. Okay, perfect. Okay, so kind of what I just introduced there. Um, I guess before I start, I, I do want to thank uh, the Craig program for sponsoring this. They provided a lot of financial support, moral support, uh, and just guidance along this. Uh, and as well with Newmont, just for uh, number one, employing me for quite a long time, uh, allowing me to map pretty much every exposure that is at Phoenix, um, uh, and then supporting analytical work after that. So uh, we, we're really appreciative of that. And I think that was a key part that uh, kind of allowed us to expand to the regional story. So uh, the title of my dissertation is The Relationship Between Eocene Magmatism and Gold Mineralization uh, in the Great Basin. So we're really trying to understand this fundamental characteristic of this province of the world being uh, very gold enriched in particular in the Eocene and again we've uh, it was kind of a scaled approach starting at in detail at the Phoenix system which is one of the gold rich uh, intrusive related deposits within the province and then expanding out from there so we'll kind of work through it in that order okay so Three parts. Um, the first is just the geologic and metallogenic framework. Uh, and this might seem like it's a little bit too detailed, but uh, this was actually a big part of the work we did was putting together this framework. So I want to go through it because I think it's really important. Uh, any of the, or all the data we generated, I think it's important that it gets placed into this context. So we'll start there and then we'll get into the, the actual study, what we did, what we we're looking at doing initially uh, and what the main takeaways are. And then from there, we'll kind of propose a genetic model for the Eocene and then also uh, how this applies to exploration, which was one of our other main goals was to put this in an applicable framework for uh, regional carlinite programs. So, okay, so here we've got uh, just a shade of relief of the Great Basin, uh, Nevada, Utah, sorry, here's outboard outline of Nevada. Um, so if we just name the major mines and districts, there's a whole slew of them. From if, uh, a whole series of different events, um, but these are the major ones. And then if we break them down into different uh, metallogenic epochs or various time periods, uh, we can start with the Jurassic in green, so Yarrington, which many are familiar with, Bald Mountain, uh, moving into the Cretaceous Age, uh, back arc or uh, uh, sedimentary drive melt related uh, systems, and then what we're focusing on here is the Eocene, which are in gold here. So there's two main clusters, one in Nevada and then one in Utah as well. And that extends down into the, the earliest Oligocene. Um, and then from there, we have uh, Oligocene uh, related to ignimbrite flare-up, uh, Round Mountain in particular, and then a number of younger uh, Eocene, or sorry, Miocene to Pliocene epithermal systems. Um, and so we're, again, going to focus just on the Eocene here. Um, and this, I think these are some pretty amazing numbers. When you look at um, the total gold endowment of the Great Basin, uh, which is about 207 million ounces of gold, uh, the Eocene represents 76% of that. Uh, I've been working on the Eocene for a number of years, uh, and just before we put together these numbers, that it just totally blew me away that it was that big of a contribution to the total province's gold endowment. Uh, and then also when you look at silver, copper, and molybdenum, it's greater than 50% of the total endowment um, in all age events. Um, so when you break that down into uh, Nevada versus Utah, which is kind of the framework we're gonna uh, take this going forward, is just looking at the two separate areas. And it really is, this would be what we consider the Nevada portion, and then this is just Utah. So when we're speaking in, in terms of Nevada versus Utah, it's those two areas. So Nevada, has produced 168 million ounces of gold, uh, 240 million ounces of silver, and very minimal copper, um, mostly from the Phoenix system. Um, and then Utah, on the other hand, has produced uh, almost 40 million ounces of gold, mostly from the Bingham uh, porphyry system, uh, 
and then a lot more silver, over a billion ounces, and then uh, significantly more, two orders of magnitude more copper, over 20 million tons of, of copper. So there's a huge discrepancy when you just look at those numbers that, in particular, Nevada's gold rich, which we all sort of know this, um, and then Utah is much more copper rich. And so that's kind of the main question. Then looking at it in percentages, Nevada and the Eocene is roughly 80% of the total gold uh, contributed during this magmatic arc event, um, or at least during this time period from about 42 to 34 MA, uh, versus Utah, which is 99% of the contained copper, or at least the produced copper, uh, and over 80% of the silver. So um, there's just a, a very large discrepancy between these two um, parts of the Eocene arc that were um, deposited during the same period of time, which is uh, very interesting. And so from here, we're just gonna dive into a little bit the Nevada gold story. So uh, what styles of mineralization the, the gold is actually hosted in, because this is a, a somewhat atypical of other arcs around the world. And so the way we've broken it apart is just in terms of relative temperature. And so this is a map of that, that square, so north central Nevada, Elko being right here, um, Battle Mountain right here. Um, so this is the leading edge of the Robertson Mountain Lachthon, so the antler, uh, the major um, rust fault of the antler orogeny, thrusting deep water rocks on top of shallower uh, carbonate rocks. And so again, we're looking at this in terms of relative temperature, and that's just related to an uh, intrusive center. So moving away, fluids get cooler. And so the first of these uh, would uh, said hosted gold deposits, and that is an important point that almost all the mineralization in Nevada is hosted in sedimentary rocks, dominantly carbonates. So the reduced gold scarns, uh, or porphyry systems uh, with some copper represent about 9% of the total Nevada Eocene gold production. Uh, there's several large deposits. Phoenix is the, is the largest. Um, they're characterized by very high gold copper ratios. Just looking at, if you look at gold PPM versus copper percent, the ratios are above two, whereas most porphyry systems are you know, much below one, below 0.5. Um, but they also have uh, silver, arsenic, bismuth, tellurium, and molybdenum associated with them, characteristically. Um, most are dominated by pyrotite, particularly in the early assemblages, but later pyrite, uh, chalcopyrite, and a lot of arsenopyrite. And then there is some magnetite in some of these systems, but it's rare, uh, and there's very little uh, to no specular hematite. The one exception is the Labrador scarn, um, copper basin, which is right in here, uh, which may be uh, different fluid sources. Uh, so there's a, a larger story there. Um, but dominantly, these are porphyry type fluids, hypersaline, uh, brine vapor inclusions have been well studied by a number of people, uh, Ted Theodore, Nash, and uh, Myers as well on the Fortitude SCARM, um, and they're uh, dominantly reduced in the, in the early uh, styles of mineralization. And here's just a, a photo example of um, what some of the, the mineralization looks like. So here's bismuth, uh, characteristic either bismuthinite or complex lead bismuth tellurides uh, with pyrotite, gold, um, and then similar with, here's K Feldspar with actinolite and pyrotite, so a reduced assemblage from Phoenix. And moving up in temperature, and again, you'll see these plotted relative to color. So uh, distal disseminated in orange, um, which represent likely a, a similar fluid, uh, just cooler. Um, they represent about 10% of total Nevada Eocene gold production. Uh, they're dominated by quartz sericite pyrite, um, almost always including arsenopyrite. Uh, spatially associated with gold scarns, you can just see the, on the map the clustering around where you get these high temperature uh, versus intermediate temperature systems. And there are several deposits that are several large deposits uh, and all but two have gold only production. Uh, typically they're associated with some base metals, uh, usually glean is phalerite, uh, so some lead zinc, a bit of chalcopyrite. Um, and commonly there's pyrotite associated with this assemblage. So here's an example of Lone Tree, which is uh, mined out by Newmont in the 1990s. Uh, but here's an Eocene rhyolite going through the high wall. Um, associated strongly with mineralization there. Um, and then here's a few examples of what Lone Tree Ore looks like. So silicious breccia, high pyrite, arsenopyrite. Um, and then here's a nice example from Dick Reed's paper on Buffalo Valley, uh, looking at the, so, some people use the term Hornfell's gold, but it's 
in Hornfels rocks associated with Eocene intrusions, but quartzerosite pyrite dominant with some scarn assemblages. And here's pyrite with a ratty arsenopyrite rim. And so those familiar with Carlin types uh, with arsenian pyrite, uh, it's uh, likely a higher temperature analog there. And so moving into what we're all most familiar with is Carlin type gold deposits uh, because they represent about 75% of the total Nevada Eocene gold production. Um, they cluster along major, uh, major trends. Uh, so the two most well-known would be the Carlin trend here, um, and then the Battle Mountain Eureka trend, however you want to define that, but extending from Eureka through Battle Mountain right in here. Um, and then also you have the Getchell trend here, uh, including Twin Creeks, Turquoise Ridge, uh, and then Jarrett Canyon up in the north. Um, so uh, again, there are many, many deposits, uh, but there's really only three world-class districts, um, and that would be Cortez in this region here, uh, the Carlin Trend, or the northern part of the Carlin Trend, um, and then Getchell, so Twin Creeks, Turquoise Ridge. Um, they're dominated by Ars Arsenium pyrite rims, uh, marcosite, and it's a classic gold arsenic, antimony, mercury, thallium, uh, plus or minus barite association, and the host rocks are typically carbonaceous carbonate units. Um, the distinctive alteration type in uh, classic Carlin type systems is carbonate removal, so decalcification, decarbon decarbonatization, um, and jasperoid as well. Um, grades are variable, but they can be very high grade uh, to where they're mined underground in sulfide, uh, double refractory sulfide in some instances, uh, so upwards of an ounce per ton. Uh, but the characteristic feature of the metals is the gold silver ratio is typically greater than one, uh, three up to 10 in some instances. Um, fluids are likely uh, dilute their lower temperature and they're mostly meteoric dominated based on isotopic work although some have evidence of magmatic or metamorphic fluids um, depending on which isotopes you're looking at um, and they're they're distal from most intrusions although some districts have eocene dikes associated with them and same in similar mineralized structures um, they form shallow probably uh, at least one to two kilometers paleo depths uh, and here's a, a few photo examples uh, from Steve Garwin's work in the Northern Carlin Trend looking at, uh, here's an example of late realgar after silica sulfide, um, and here's an example of silica sulfide, uh, which you see in some distal disseminated districts. Um, and then here's an example of just decalcified carbonaceous rock there. And these are all uh, ore grade, so 0.2 ounce, 2 ounce, and 0.2 ounce there. Okay, so moving up to the lowest temperature, um, so this is from a lot of really great work by Elizabeth Holling's work, and then Mike as well, uh, looking at uh, paleo surface or essentially Carlin type deposits, but uh, deposited very near the Eocene paleo surface. So these represent about 6% of total Nevada Eocene gold production. Um, they're at or near Eocene unconformities. There's instances where Eocene conglomerates that are contemporaneous with mineralization are, are mineralized and they're surface deposits or they were deposited on the surface. Um, the distinctive alteration is jasperoid along with barite. Um, there's local overprinting epithermal quartz textures, which are pretty interesting. Uh, and the geochemical association is similar to Carlin's. Uh, the big difference is the gold-silver ratio is less than one, and in some cases around 0.1. So you see uh, much more silver enrichment uh, versus classic Carlin type deposits. Uh, and again, they're distal and shallow. So typically less than 500 meter paleo depths and low temperature. So here's some nice photos of the Southern Carlin Trend region here of coliform quartz barite with stibnite cutting jasperoid. Uh, and then here's an example of barite uh, quartz overprinting jasperoid. And this is at Gold Standard Ventures uh, pinion deposit. And again, I urge you to take a look at anything that Elizabeth Hollingsworth has put out because it's really interesting. Uh, new work on these types of systems. Uh, and, and the other uh, well-known region is the Alligator Ridge area um, that also hosts these uh, near-surface Carlin-style, Carlin-type deposits. Okay, so just to summarize that, um, there's four main deposit types, low to high temperature. So from high temperature, we classify them as reduced cold scarns or porphyries, uh, basically porphyry systems just said hosted. Um, Distal disseminated gold, so moving out, uh, commonly associated with Eocene intrusions, uh, Carlin type gold, uh, and then Paleosophers Carlin type gold. And so the key characteristic of 
basically all of these is they're gold dominant, especially from an economic standpoint. Uh, they do have variable base metals uh, plus silver. Uh, the deposits formed at roughly 42 to 34 MA, uh, depending on the age of magnetism, but they correlate really nicely with uh, a Southwest Younging trend of magnetism. Um, the differences, again, reflect the variation in exposure level and likely the distance from major intrusions. Uh, and really interestingly, the division between the shallowly versus deeply formed set hosted systems, um, it, it likely reflects, reflects just, again, different levels of exposure based on uh, post mineral offsets and basin range extension. But the world class Carlin type de deposits formed west of the Roberts Mountain Lachlan. Um, and underneath the Roberts Mountain Crest dominantly. So there may be some regional control there that many have written about. Um, and lastly, sort of transitioning to what we did here, uh, the, the two styles, there are two styles clearly intrusion related and that's the these red and orange uh, where you, you can actually see the intrusions and they're mineralized. So it's, it's much easier to make that connection. Um, and then when you look at Carlin types, there are examples where uh, coeval intrusions are mineralized but you're much further away from the source and it gets more complicated, particularly isotopically, to figure out where fluid components may have come from. Okay, so uh, this, again, this is just to review these different styles because it's really important to, to understand that these gold dominant systems don't occur in uh, all uh, arcs around the world. So it's a unique characteristic, especially in Nevada of the Eocene arc. So now we kind of want to know what uh, what the big differences are um, and then what changes. So we're going to focus mostly on the high temperature systems from here on out. So the two biggest are Bingham here and Phoenix Fortitude, both about 39 MA. Um, but we focus on the high temperature again because it's unequivocal that they're related to, uh, at least the mineralization is related to magnetism. Um, so again, they're both 38 to 39 MA. Here's some nice photos from previous publications looking at high temperature quartz veins. So Bingham, you have A-type quartz with chalcopyrite uh, with some bornite magnetite assemblages, uh, more oxidized uh, versus Phoenix, which here's an example of a quartz, A-type quartz vein with uh, hydrothermal case bar and biotite with bismuthinite, native gold, chalcopyrite, and pyrotite. And that's a relatively common assemblage in the early H-type veins, and you just don't see that in Bingham or other world-class porphyries, uh, copper, porphyry copper systems around the world. Um, they're both gold-rich, interestingly. Um, Bingham is one of the most gold-enriched porphyry systems, uh, but they have a very contrasting gold-copper ratio just from known resources. So uh, Phoenix is about four versus Bingham, which is about 0.4, so an order of magnitude difference. Um, they're both spatially associated with distal silver lead zinc, uh, replacement districts, uh, and then also Carlin style occurrences or gold arsenic jasperoids, um, but distal gold and arsenic rich um, styles of mineralization. Um, at Bingham, mineralization is dominantly oxidized, um, various sulfidation states depending on where you are in the system, but relatively oxidized uh, versus Bingham or versus Phoenix, which is more reduced, very stable. Uh, Bingham, the magmas have been well characterized, well studied. They're highly oxidized uh, versus Phoenix, which has been, uh, there's been a number of good studies on it, uh, but it's somewhat complicated as to what the oxidation state is. So that's why we wanted to look at it in more detail. But some studies have suggested it's reduced, others have suggested it's oxidized. Um, so we wanted to look at that in some more detail. Um, and the big question is why, why do you have this difference? Do we have the same? The same likely source melts, mantle-derived subduction-related melts coming up through the crust and they're producing two very different high-temperature porphyry systems. And so that's kind of the fundamental question that we want to understand. And so to start that, um, we're going to look at what the main differences are moving east to west. So just a little bit of geologic background. The, this, the Great Basin is dominated by a westward thickening sequence of uh, passive margin sediments, basically a platform carbonate sequence that gets uh, deeper and uh, stratigraphy changes to more basin slope dominant as you move west. So this is just showing that a nice figure from Harry Cook. This would be Western Utah, just showing the thickening and the darker the colors, the more carbonaceous the rocks. But roughly central Nevada, you get into dominantly slope and basin facies where uh, sediments were deposited in 
in an anoxic setting, so you get more reduced carbon uh, within the package versus up on the platform, carbonates are much cleaner um, and, and less carbonaceous. So that's a really key uh, point is that in Utah, the, you have differences in redox, just the re oxidation reduction capacity of the rocks. But the other big piece is the, the passive margin sequence is about two kilometers thick in Utah, and it's up to 15 kilometers thick in Nevada. Um, and that's partly because of thrust sheets and duplexing, but uh, it's also just a much thicker sequence as you move into Nevada. Okay, so now we're looking to look at eocene magmatism and related metal deposits. So here's uh, just a shaded relief map, Salt Lake City, Elko for reference, roughly 50 kilometers here. Um, and then here's uh, what we call the Eocene Igneous Province, but more or less the Eocene uh, Magmatic Arc. It's been extended uh, 50 to 100%. Uh, so it's to the east-west from post-mineral basin range offset, so keep that in mind. But all the red are Eocene igneous rocks that have been mapped. Um, and then here's, looking at the magmatic sweep, the uh, starting about 50, 55 MA magmatism reinitiated following uh, laramide compression, where the slab was subducting relatively flatly. So you get, uh, so melting was generated further inland. So as Starting about 55, the slab began to roll back to normal steeper geometry. So you've, you've got a, a southwest younging trend of magmatism related to where the melting was being generated from the subducting slab. Um, and so you see that in the ages. Uh, Chris Henry's done a lot of work on this and a number of other people are looking at this age sweep, but it roughly uh, southwest to west, uh, depending on how it's reconstructed, um, the magmatic arc moved in that direction. Um, so here we're looking at uh, the platform shelf margin. So looking at the sedimentary rocks and the, the crustal column. So this is an, just a line to mark the easternmost boundary defined by Harry Cook of the uh, slope and basin rocks. So everything to the west would be slope and basin facies dominantly. Um, and then everything to the east would be uh, platform to uh, tidal type carbonate set, uh, settings. And then here marks the Strontium 706 line, so theoretically the edge of the Precambrian craton. So you get into more accreted terrains out in this region. And here's where the significant gold deposits and major deposits clusters uh, are plotted. So here's the Eocene gold systems we've been talking about, major deposits and districts. And then here are the Eocene uh, porphyry copper plus silver lead zinc replacement districts. So Bingham, Tintic, and Park City are the three main ones. The, so you, again, you see that discrepancy and it correlates with where you get the slope basin facies rocks where you get gold rich mineralization and more reduced style mineralization. Um, and here's just some, a review of some of the isotopic work um, that suggests that in the West, uh, Eocene magmas interacted more strongly with, um, in this case, uh, this is oxygen isotope of silicates looking and the higher the value, the more crust was interacted with likely. That's the interpretation at least. So you can see here, just based on the creating, the darker the color is, the higher the value, and the more interaction magmas have had with crust. And then versus over in this region, they're uh, much closer to magmatic oxygen isotopic values. Um, similar, uh, this is just looking at uh, delta 34 sulfur, sulfur isotopes. Um, values get heavier in, as you get into these uh, slope and basin rocks uh, because of the detrital sulfur uh, pushing the value up. And then looking at the aluminum saturation index, uh, just whole rock values to get an understanding of what the crustal input may have been. So the higher the value, likely the more uh, luminous crust was assimilated by magmas. And you, you see a similar trend here. Um, this was work published by Greg Earhart and some of his students where they uh, did a detailed study looking at this relationship. And that was their conclusion that in this region of Nevada, you get much more um, interaction with crust. Um, and then the final piece before we get into the study is just looking, here's a, a nice study by Tomlinson and others in 2000, looking at unaltered lavas of the Eocene event. And as you move, uh, this is scaled to the map. So as you move to the west here, we have longitude, uh, and this is oxidation state on a log scale moving up on the black line, and here's whole rock copper of lavas. So you see a nice correlation between whole rock copper, uh, oxidation state calculated, and where you get porphyry copper systems uh, versus where you get uh, Nevada gold trends. So 
Um, the data are somewhat sparse in here, um, but so we tried to, I wanted to fill that in a bit to look at the oxidation story there. Okay, so now on to part two. So what do we actually do? Um, so our main goals, um, just to review what we, what we know or think we know, um, Eocene magmas were particularly fertile throughout the Great Basin. They produced world-class systems of both porphyry, copper, gold, uh, silver, lead, zinc for placement, uh, and carbon style, as well as gold scarm. Um, the shallow crust becomes more reducing from east to west. It thickens as well, and Eocene volcanics show a similar trend along with increased evidence of crustal interaction from previous isotopic work. Um, as you move westward, Eocene mineral deposits increasingly become more gold rich and copper poor, and that's at high and low temperatures. And in Nevada, in the west, uh, mineralization styles are characterized by more reduced assemblages, especially pyrotite and arsenopyrite, as well as bismuth and iron. So our main question, uh, the little piece that, that we wanted to try to add to the story is, does the magmatic redox change in ore-related intrusions? So not just looking at lavas, but looking at intrusions that generated mineralization, um, does it change east to west? And what are the implications of this for gold, copper, and melts and fluids, as well as sulfur? Uh, and then in general, the roots of what would define a gold-rich mineralogenic province. And so we took a scaled approach. Uh, There's an initial focus on mapping. Uh, so we looked at the gold-rich Phoenix system in detail, and then also looking at the intrusions. Um, from there, we expanded out, uh, once we figured out some methods that worked, um, to a regional sample suite. Uh, and then the whole goal was to place these new data into uh, a genetic model and then also a regional exploration model. Okay, so uh, just a little bit on background. I'm going to move pretty quickly. Um, but at Phoenix, there's a whole lot of mapping. Essentially, any rock that was available to be mapped, I had... Uh, looked at it and mapped it over about three years. Um, and then following that, uh, we did some petrography and SEM work to refine the vein assemblages, uh, alteration mineralogy. Um, we did some select argon, argon ages and rheum osmium ages, uh, as well as a number of uranium lead ages. Um, and then looking at the igneous rocks, we, so at Phoenix Fortitude, there were 12 separate intrusive phases that we looked at. Um, and then we expanded out to 21 regional intrusions from these different centers here. So here's, we looked at Bingham, Stockton, Tintic. Uh, we also included San Francisco, which turns out is younger than was originally thought. Um, and then in Nevada, we looked at the Bullion, a railroad district, Southern Carlin Trend, uh, Dykes at Betsy, uh, Beast, and Deep Star. Uh, and then uh, Battle Mountain, uh, Phoenix Fortitude, as well as a Rhyolite Dyke up by Copper Basin, uh, and then Hilltop and Granite Mountain. Um, and so we, the methods we employed, uh, dominantly laser ablation work on zircons uh, for uranium lead ages, but also trace and rare earth elements, a whole slew of analyses there. Um, and then from there, we expanded out to trying a newer method uh, called ZANES, which stands for X-ray absorption near edge spectroscopy or structure. Um, and the whole goal was to look at cerium speciation. Um, and that's because zircon can take in cerium three plus and cerium four plus, uh, which is a function <laughs> of oxidation state. Um, and so we use Zanes uh, to uh, very high spatially, uh, spatial resolution to understand cerium speciation uh, to get an idea of oxidation state. Um, and then from there, we did uh, detailed appetite microprobe work uh, just to look at sulfur and chlorine variances across this province. Okay, uh, so from for the next few slides, we're gonna look at the Phoenix story and just the, really just the time space component. We won't get into the geology much but, um, just because we don't really have time. Uh, but here, uh, this is a map, alteration map of Phoenix. Uh, and dominantly what you're gonna see are browns, which are biotite hornfells or case silicate assemblages, uh, mostly in aluminous silicate rocks. Uh, and then greens are scarns, dominantly pyroxene. Um, with some uh, chloride actinolite assemblages shown in this uh, teal color, and then quartzite pyrite in yellow, uh, and a bit of potassium within the intrusive centers here. So again, uh, can't go into too much detail on that for time, but the main thing we worked out in the in the three red circles are what look like three different magnetic hydrothermal centers, um, and they're associated strongly with uh, what we term the P1 porphyries, or the earliest uh, quartz biotite hornblende plage porphyry dikes that occur in these three locations. 
Um, and they're especially associated with where, uh, especially where you get garnet scar, the most proximal garnet scar, uh, as well as pyroxene, um, some potassic assemblages in uh, igneous rocks, and then some magnetite scar uh, in the southern area, uh, and then pyrotite bodies as well. And then from there, the main intrusive center is the Upper Canyon Stock, uh, which it's not clear what contribution that had to uh, metals and fluids, but it's the volumetrically most important. Uh, likely produced a lot of the biotite horn felsing uh, just through, through pure heat and calcium horn felsing. Uh, and then the last phase uh, is what we call the P2 porphyries, just later porphyries. Uh, they're case barfuric up to two centimeters in some places, uh, quartz biotite horn blend plage porphyries. And they're spatially associated very strongly with intense QSP. Uh, they fill similar structures. Um, also, external chloride scarring, which is just this, it's the same fluid as QSP uh, or xenopyrite, just on top of pre existing pyroxene scarring. Um, so, here's what some of the veins look like. Uh, again, complicated, uh, but these are just early associated with P1 porphyries, uh, biotite case bar. Uh, quartz veins with pyrotite calcopyrite dominantly. Uh, and when you get in calcareous rocks, it's pyroxene dominant uh, with some methadote here and there. But different vein assemblages, the main characteristic is they're early, high temperature, um, gold, copper rich, and they're dominated by pyrotite and calcopyrite, except for the latest, latest veins. Um, and then stage two associated with P2 porphyries are much different. Um, in that they're dominated by sericitic alteration um, with pyrite arsenopyrite. They're much more sulfide rich, and the geochemical assemblage is gold arsenic antimony, bismuth, and tellurium. And actually, gold and bismuth correlate almost one to one in these veins. Um, and there, there is some base metals associated with it, but these are what some of the structures look like here. Here's a nice example of arsenopyrite with calcopyrite and pyrite cutting an earlier A-type vein, so biotite case bar being converted to muscovite illite. Um, and then here's an example of some breccia textures with galena and sphalerite uh, with actinolite chloride over the top of earlier pyroxene. So again, a lot more to that story, but the, the takeaway is that the veins get um, a sulfidation state increases. So it goes from pyrotite dominant to pyrite dominant and later, um, and also the sulfide and gold rich nature of mineralization increases through time. Okay, uh, so here's a time-space diagram. So here we just have time increasing this way, and then this is just depth. So here would be the Eocene paleo surface here, uh, and then this would be the current surface, you know, one to two kilometers. Um, and here's just showing early intrusion of the batholith that uh, Caleb King did a lot of work on defining throughout the Battle Mountain District, likely a very large uh, district scale batholith. Um, intruding, we don't exactly know the depth, but possibly four, five, six kilometers, somewhere in there. Uh, and then the earliest phase of uh, intrusion and also magmatic hydrothermal contribution is these P1 porphyry dikes, again, in three different locations, but you know, breaching of a magmatic cupola, release of melt and fluid, and you get uh, dominantly high temperature assemblages in these carbonate rocks at Phoenix, uh, depending on what you're in, but scarn versus potassic. Um, and then the fluids, they zone out uh, laterally and in, uh, probably, we don't know vertically, but likely vertically in the silver lead zinc dominant uh, and then possibly gold arsenic jasperoids. Um, the next stage, again, is the Copper Canyon stock, volumetrically most important. Uh, we don't, again, it's not obvious what uh, contribution it had to metals, but it does have contained quartz veins, uh, mostly barren uh, within the stock, so likely provided some fluid. Uh, at least coeval with it, um, but again, not, not quite sure what the mineralization contribution was. Um, and then the last event, just shown by uh, the, this is just showing crystallization of the underlying baffles. So likely the P2 porphyries uh, were derived from a deeper level, uh, more evolved melt, which we'll look at in a second. Um, so the higher temperature assemblages are much deeper. And so what, at the level of Phoenix Fortitude, you get lower temperature assemblages. Mostly uh, quartz sericite pyrite or xenopyrite, uh, and then retrograde type scarring over the top. Um, and then as well laterally into uh, jasperite rich gold and arsenic animal mineralization. And so, again, th this is likely what results in the overprinting, where you get this earlier high temperature scarring that's clearly cut by later 
retrograde or hydrate scarn minerals with quartz stratocyte pyrite that's much more structurally controlled. And here's what it looks like at the pit scale. So here, this is the Fortitude pit. The Copper Canyon stock sits roughly here, uh, again, roughly here. So this is gold in the top versus copper. And what I've shown here, this is the P1 Fortitude dike, uh, likely a few dikes, but only one that sticks out in the pits. Here it is here. And then this is the P2 Porphyry dike. Uh, there's a change in elevation, so you get a, a step down in the main structure and P2 dike. But you can see, uh, especially with copper, the strong association of the locus of copper mineralization is with the location of this P1 porphyry. And then fluids were uh, transported out these northeast structures and then into the main virgin fault here. Um, similar, you can see these, what are called the link faults, but they're mineralized. Um, and then these clusters of mineralization are just a function of lithology. So it's a more calcareous unit. And so copper, you can see as you get further from the source, it just, uh, due to temperature and solubility of copper, you just lose uh, copper grades and mineralization moving out. Um, and then gold is a little bit more complicated because there's two main events that brought gold in. Um, but gold was certainly brought in with the early P1 porphyries with garnet pyroxene scarn, especially in this area. Uh, notably, the lower fortitude gold scarn, which was about 11 million tons at uh, 5 grams. So that's mined out, which is why there's no data there. But uh, very high grade, the highest grade portion of the district. Um, and you can see much of the higher grade gold, so the reds, which are greater than uh, three up to five grams, are the later quartz sericite pyrite overprints on, on top of uh, earlier SCARM. So you can see they're uh, channeled here. Okay, and here's what it looks at at the, like at the district scale. So early uh, one kilometer for scale, here's the full copper SCARM center uh, grading out to a gold rich uh, SCARM zone and into the Galena sub-district silver lead zinc dominant carbonate replacement um, and then outboard of that uh, in plastic rocks you get anemone gold arsenic bismuth tellurium quartz veins here historic prospects and then here in the antler sequence which is the main host uh, carbonate host mineralization you have the south antler gold arsenic rich jasperoids which are it's a relatively clean limestone so uh, it's structurally controlled um, and so it doesn't have a major volume as far as is known Okay, uh, looking at the Phoenix Fortitude geochronology, this is going to be really quick because there's a lot, but we did 12 new uranium lead ages here, and this is just all known ages in the district, but they plot roughly in the middle, um, pretty tight clustering between about 39 and 40. Um, you can't break out different intrusions phases because of the errors in uranium lead at this age. Um, we did four argon argon ages, uh, two biotites in blue, which Turned out really nicely. Early biotite hornfells um, separates. They overlap nicely with the age of, of magnetism. Uh, and then two rhenium osmium ages here, which one overlaps nicely, another is older, but overlaps with some of the other ages on similar intrusions in the district. Uh, and then two ages on sericite uh, from the QSP events, which are uh, they're too old. They uh, likely suffer from 39 argon recoil. Uh, so they between 42 and 44. Uh, so we know that they cut the biotite here, so they're definitely too old, uh, but it demonstrates they likely are using. Okay, so now from here we're going to focus on magmatism, uh, looking at the, the different intrusions at Phoenix and then the regional story. Um, so here we have P1 porphyries, the copper cane stock, and then P2. And again, this is the three locations uh, likely magmatic hydrothermal centers. So the geochemical trends match the geology, and we're going to look mostly at zircon geochemistry because whole rocks uh, is all the rocks are intensely altered. Um, so the zircon geochemistry is quite useful because it's resistant. So here we have hafnium increasing this direction, and then the uranium ytterbium ratio, which is, increases with melt differentiation. So the colors from here on out are the darker greens for the Phoenix and blues from Phoenix are going to be the the P1 in green, and then the earlier there's some diorites that are uh, unrelated to mineralization. Um, and then the later reds and pinks are the P2 porphyries. So it shows a distinct difference uh, in uh, melt differentiation. The P2s are more evolved and the P1s, there is some overlap, but they're dominantly uh, less evolved compositions. Um, and the Upper Canyon stock, which is a little bit tough to see, is roughly in here. So somewhat intermediate, suggesting it's intermediate between the two. 
And again, the P2 porphyry here get up to the most evolved compositions. Okay, we did a lot of work on the oxidation state. Uh, fortunately, and I'm going to talk about this before we talk about the Zanes data, there's a new formulation by uh, Laux and others in, that just came out about a month ago that uses the uranium, cerium, and titanium content in zircon to calculate oxidation state. The air, uh, one sigma error is about 0.6 log units, um, so it's a little bit uh, more coarse than iron titanium oxides uh, or other methods, but it's the only real way in altered uh, intrusive rocks to calculate oxidation state. So using this method, uh, the overall average FO2 is relative to the phthalite magnetite quartz uh, reaction line, which is this, this is a common uh, line to use relative to for oxidation states. Um, it's FMQ minus 0.13, which is uh, much lower than many other arc related. Uh, systems. And if we look at uh, the different uh, intrusions, same color scheme as the last map. Um, overall, and again, there's a decent amount of error on these data, most plot within about a log unit of FMQ, plus or minus one. Um, the early higher temperature zircons have a decent amount of scatter, but the most oxidized is this dark green, which is the fortitude porphyry here. Um, and that, and then the later uh, intrusions are seem to be more reduced, so less than FMQ. But this is, it's somewhat complicated because this contrasts with previous work, uh, especially work that Caleb King did uh, relatively recently, where he calculated oxidation states of FMQ plus two to three. Um, and there is titanite in these igneous rocks uh, with, with magnetite. We didn't see any in our uh, petrography, but um, others have noted it. Uh, there is minor ilmenite that's been noted, uh, so it's, with magnetite titanite, it suggests it's more oxidized, uh, FMQ plus two, somewhere in there. So uh, there's more to the story there, but these are the data that, that we've calculated at this point. All right, and now looking at the cerium zanes, which we did uh, because it was the best proxy for uh, uh, oxidation state prior to this calculation. Uh, the main story is that the P1 porphyries in green show a higher uh, cerium four plus ratio, so more oxidized cerium contents versus hafnium here, so melt evolution moving this way. So dominantly, they're, uh, they show much more uh, cerium four plus rich zircons uh, versus the later P2 porphyries. Uh, there is some scatter because later intrusions always include earlier crystallized zircons. Um, and somewhat complicated of a plot, but these are just histograms, uh, so increasing this way it's more four plus going that way. Um, so the greens, these are the fortitude porphyries. So again, the P1 uh, fortitude porphyry, which was the most oxidized calculated, it also, is also by far the most oxidized uh, looking from serum four plus. Um, and then moving down into the uh, P2 porphyries, they're uh, significantly more reduced, uh, at least serum four, three ratios. And this correlates with a reducing trend of gold copper mineralization. So uh, in terms of fractionation between the two, so the earliest are associated with gold and copper rich, whereas the latest are associated with uh, gold rich dominantly with very little copper, which could just be temperature dependence, but uh, it is an interesting relationship. Okay, so here we're gonna step into the regional study. So 33 new uranium lead zircon ages. Um, I'm not gonna dive into these in, in any detail, but they're mostly correlate with regional age dating. Um, the one difference is the San Francisco or Milford district, quartz monzonite porphyry is 23 MA. The original mapping had it at 31, which is why we sampled it. Um, but it's still relative or relevant just because it's likely a similar origin. Um, we, mostly we use the ages to identify zircons that were actually eocene that we could do detailed work on. But here's this map again showing our different sample sites. So we know from, at least we think from Phoenix, it's moderately reduced, and it shows a reducing trend through time. Uh, here's the Nevada versus Utah. So Nevada in gold and Utah in red. So these are the calculated oxidation states using the LOX formulation. You can see um, pretty clearly that uh, this, the Utah samples plot much more oxidized, uh, about two log units higher than most of the Nevada intrusions. There is some scatter uh, in the earlier higher temperature zircons. From Nevada, um, but the averages again are about two log units difference, and there's two trends apparent through time. There's 
either an oxidized trend or a more oxidizing trend in Utah uh, following differentiation versus a reducing trend in Nevada. Um, here's what they look like. Just uh, this would be Nevada or Utah versus Nevada. So uh, much, not much overlap except for in the, some of the earlier uh, zircons from Nevada. Um, and here's uh, getting back to the initial question: Bingham versus Phoenix. Here are all the Bingham zircons. Uh, here are all the Phoenix zircons calculated. Uh, there's very little overlap, and they're the same age, but they're between two to four log units different. Uh, again, there is some overlap because of the the error here, but um, in general, they seem to be two separate populations. Um, and here's the cerium zanes regional data. Uh, so here's uranium ytterbium ratio. So proxy for differentiation, and then here's decreasing cerium-4 value, so being more reduced. You can see the Utah samples, um, much more oxidized, gets lots of overlap between the two, but Nevada are the only samples that show all the way down to 0% cerium-4, uh, so entirely cerium-3+, plus, fully reduced. And here's what it looks like on the histogram, so 100% cerium-4, 0%, so Utah has uh, almost double uh, the amount of 100% cerium-4, and then as you move down, you get a decay in Utah, bottoming out at about 50, and then Nevada continues, and there's a number of 100% cerium-3 plus zircons, so showing a more reduced uh, trend. And then here's what they look like, the individual intrusions. So again, that full, full range here, uh, especially with the later, more evolved intrusions, the bull rhyolite, battle mountain rhyolite, um, uh, the deep star light and the beasts as well show that almost a full range whereas if you look at the swansea rhyolite at tintic uh, you just don't see that range at all so any of the more evolved intrusions in utah don't have that and we'll be really quick here on the appetites um, but the takeaway is that these are this is on the log scale chlorine versus sulfur uh, the appetite from separates from utah are much more sulfur enriched um, Typical or on par with other porphyry related systems, and then these are just showing averages here um, versus Nevada, which the plot is it's difficult to show because even though many of them are more more lower sulfur values, if you look at the just below detection limit analyses, uh, so that's below this 0.01, um, over half of the Nevada appetites are below that um, versus Utah only 10%. So there's a big difference in the sulfur content. Um, in appetites, whereas the chlorine, uh, in some of the more evolved intrusions, you, you do get lower chlorine values, but it's roughly correlative there. And we'll just skip over this, but this is just showing the differences. Interestingly, the Bingham samples are the most sulfur enriched, the Bingham appetites, from some of the proper intrusions there. Um, and then similar with Nevada, the, the Betsy Day site, which is the least evolved intrusion uh, from that part of the Carlin trend, uh, looks pretty typical of the Utah samples. And then here's our Phoenix water two plots, so a bit lower. Okay, so what are the takeaways from this? So, somewhat of a complicated diagram, but uh, looking at the oxidation state increasing this direction, and then this is, on this axis is the magmatic gold-copper ratio, which has been determined experimentally by Zajax and others. Uh, so that's this plot here, showing gold-copper ratio of a melt, uh, at least solubility. And then here are just a number of different uh, magmas that have had oxidation state calculated. Um, and here are our Nevada samples showing, uh, with errors plotted, the averages, so showing a lower reduced state, uh, plotting over this region of more enriched gold, um, and it's important that this is right about the region where sulfur converts from uh, reduced sulfur, 2 minus to sulfur 6 plus, sulfate, which is a really, uh, is a critical mechanism for dissolving more sulfur in a melt, um, and is likely an important mechanism for pore regeneration in general. Um, and so the, especially the mineralizing intrusions here at Bingham, uh, Stockton, and Tintic are more oxidized than even the earlier ones in Utah. Um, but it, it looks like Eocene primitive magmas were initially oxidized, both in Nevada and Utah. Um, overall, inter intermediate magmas are more reduced in Nevada than Utah by about two to three log units. And Nevada follows a systematic reducing trend through time. That's both in Zane's data and uh, in the calculated values. Um, Utah seems to retain that higher oxidation state or potentially becomes more oxidized through time. And the key takeaway 
uh, one of the key takeaways is that Phoenix Fortitude is two to four log units using the same formulation uh, lower in FO2 than Bingham. Uh, and potentially that's what explains the differences in mineralization styles. You also have to factor in the wall rock compositions, which are influencing fluids as well, so likely reducing Phoenix fluids even further. Um, and the sulfur story, uh, eosine magmas in Utah have sulfur-rich appetite, which is probably a function of a higher oxidation state uh, because sulfur-2- minus gets converted to sulfur-6+, plus, which is partitions more strongly into appetite. Um, potentially, it's a higher melt sulfur solubility, um, potentially higher uh, melt sulfur contents in Utah, um, and possibly the reason why they seem to be more sulfidized, the deposits in Utah are more sulfur-rich. But the real, I think one of the, the big key takeaways is that the differences in redox, the main influence it's going to have is changing the reduced sulfur to oxidized sulfur ratio. So the two main volatile components, SO2 and H2S. In Nevada, you'll have much more H2S rich uh, volatiles, fluids. Uh, and then in Utah, you'll have more SO2 enriched. And so here we'll just get to the last bit quickly. Um, and so here's a schematic cross-section through the Great Basin. So here's where Utah sits limestone and, and sandstone, so tidal flat beach type settings with evaporites, some very oxidizing rocks, moving out to Nevada in this slope and basin setting here. So regionally, the crust becomes thicker and more reducing, moving westward. Um, the zircon data indicate magmas also become more reducing to the west. And from a redox standpoint, if you just looked at that and you took the two same melts and you put them up through that crust, you would predict oxidized systems in uh, Utah and reduced systems in Nevada. So here's our uh, magmatic model. So primitive, you know, 25 uh, kilometers or more. Uh, mafic melts, probably oxidized, so you retain more sulfur, copper, and gold in the melt. Uh, they ascend to shallow levels here and reduce or, and interact with the crust. So here is showing Utah kind of with the white background and Nevada with the darker, uh, just simulating reducing crusts. So assimilate and interact with reduced crust here. Uh, it reduces the oxidation state and it increases the amount of H2S. Uh, whereas in Utah, uh, interaction with the crust either didn't affect the oxidation state or increased it in possibly some cases where evaporites were. Um, and likely you're going to get things all over the spectrum just because of de degrees of interaction. Um, the changes in oxidation state results and potentially gold-rich magnetic hydrothermal fluids in Nevada. We'll look at this in more detail in a second, um, and copper-rich in Utah. And so here's some plots uh, just very quickly looking at, from Zoltan Zajax, looking at oxidation state increasing here. And this is copper partitioning from a melt to the volatile. And so here you can see this is equivalent to about FMQ uh, plus one and a half, plus one here. So the highest ball, uh, partition, partitioning of gold into a fluid is at this moderately reduced to reduced level. As you get more oxidized, it just becomes much less efficient. Um, and copper, um, do, there just isn't much difference at all. We're talking a difference between 0.5 and 2 between them. And uh, chlorine probably has a more important impact there. And then this is just showing oxidation state increasing here, and this is the copper-gold ratio. So the copper-gold ratio increases dramatically as you get more oxidized, and that's uh, potentially what we're seeing in the Great Basin. Um, and this has important implications for low temperature fluids. So uh, gold transport to low temperature environments is further enhanced by the reduced state, um, reduced sulfur content, especially in the early fluids, and the buffering capacity of the carbonaceous rocks, because gold solubility this is at 250C, is highest in a reduced sulfur setting uh, and near neutral pH. So slope uh, carbonate is probably the optimal rock to transport fluids through to retain gold in solution until you can develop some sort of mechanism to precipitate it. Uh, in the case of carlin, it would be sulfidation. Um, and so here's the top part of that model here, so showing the differences between the two. So in Utah, you get a classic oxidized porphyry copper system with CRDs, carbon replacement deposits, and then potentially Carlin style, but just jasperoid and decalcification dominant gold arsenic mineralization. And then vertical flow path would be a high sulfidation epithermal. And so in Utah, there's a lot of SO2, so you get much more advanced argillic alteration. Whereas in Nevada, it's SO2 poor from the beginning, so potentially that's, this is why there's not a lot of lithocaps in Nevada. 
um, versus other arcs around the world. There just may not have been that much SO2 around to generate that acid upon dissociation. And so here's showing the four different classes. So reduced porphyry scarn here um, in the high temperature. This would be a lateral flow path. Um, so this distal disseminated style, and this would be a vertical flow path. So distal disseminated here associated with dikes. And then Farland style mineralization distal, uh, south antler would be an example of that at uh, Phoenix. And then potentially at the northern Carlin trend or Cortez, where it looks like a vertical flow path is the most dominant fluid transport. Um, you would get Carlin site mineralization here, a kilometer or so deep, and then paleo surface style where fluids got to the paleo surface. So it seems that Eocene magmatic hydrothermal systems produced a continuum of gold rich systems, especially in Nevada, particularly in Nevada, and that's high and low temperature. Um, a really important point to make is it's not an argument for all Carlin systems being magmatic hydrothermal. Um, this is a point that Mark Barton and others have made in previous work. Um, that to form jasperoid and decalcification, it's not it's not that difficult to do with other fluids. Uh, just a cooling and acidic, metamorphic or meteoric derived water can generate that same style of alteration um, and transport gold as well. So. These are all likely active processes over the past 250 million years. So probably systems in Nevada, there's a whole slew of different mechanisms. We just think in some instances where the ages are well constrained, there's clear intrusions associated with it, that there's uh, magmatic hydrothermal origin makes a lot of sense, especially with this framework. Um, and so if you look at just for the foundation of gold rich provinces, the lower magmatic redox initially um, produces an abundance of reduced sulfur as long as you don't fractionate uh, a lot of sulfides, magmatic sulfides, and that's a key point. Um, and fluids will be more rich in reduced sulfur, which is most effective at transporting gold to low temperatures. Um, and this seems to be an optimal setting to form a gold-rich metallogeny, especially when your host units are reduced carbonates uh, that have iron for available for sulfidation. Okay, and the last bit here, uh, so uh, just a, a, a model that can be applied globally. So hydrous continental arc magmatism is critical, but a variation being that magmas more re were reduced by major interaction with a thick wedge of carbonaceous rocks, uh, which enhances gold solubility in the melts and also extraction, especially extraction from the melt and optimized gold transport to low temperature. Um, it seems to be important to be tectonically neutral to extensional, which optimizes fluid flow to shallow levels. Um, and then also uh, the Eocene, there are abundant lake sediments, uh, coeval lake sediments that suggest there was abundant crustal meteoric water that can help bolster hydrothermal systems um, uh, that are provided from those shallow basins. And so here's just a map we put together looking at uh, places you might suspect a Carlin type metallogeny and characteristics would be High temperature deposits that are gold rich, so aka failed porphyry coppers, reduced intrusion gold or gold scarn systems. So the Tintina belt here is the best analog of that. Reduced intrusion gold systems with Carlin type occurrences. Um, high temperature mineralogy contains reduced assemblages, pyrotite, arsenopyrite, bismuthinite, uh, shelite as well, which occurs at Phoenix. Um, and low temperature deposits are gold rich, silver poor uh, with pyrite, arsenopyrite marcosite and arsenic antimony, mercury and thallium. So we think that's a framework that can be applied uh, to a number of different regions. You know, we just highlighted a few of them, but there's probably a lot more than this that shows some of these characteristics. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I went a little bit long, but there's a whole lot there. Uh, and I appreciate any questions you might have from here. So thank you. Okay, Curtis, do you want to, oh, yep, stop sharing, good. Yep. Uh, trying to see where the uh, raise hand would be. Uh, what do we have to do for that? Uh, Mike, this is Brian, Brian Cousins. You click up, up participants, you'll get a list on the right of all, all the people who are here. here. And uh, yep. the lower, lower corner has the, the raise hand option. Uh, Okay. 
Sorry, everybody. I see the list, Brian, but I don't see uh, the option. Yeah, Mike, I got was the same thing in, in, in Zoom presentation. Signs the race, his hand appears on some people's uh, uh, list, but on all. Alan Morris has raised the hand. Yep. Maybe. Go okay. ahead, Alan. Oh, I see, yep. Uh, yeah, just one quick question. At Copper Canyon, up a place called Galena Canyon, uh, between Battle Mountain and Copper Canyon, is a uh, replacement type uh, lead zinc silver deposit. Um, also, one at Ward Mountain, Nevada, and on, and near Robertson. How does that kind of? I noticed you kind of discounted those in your uh, grand unification theory there for Utah. So, how does that? fit into the kind of overall uh, system? Uh, I think it, I think it fits in well. Um, uh, Robinson would be a different age, uh, but especially Galena Canyon, I, I think carbonate replacement deposits are part of that continuum. Uh, a lot of them seem to be gold rich. Uh, and in terms of the gold rich deposits, uh, the distal disseminated are potentially a bit higher temperature than the carbon replacements, but yeah, we, we didn't talk about those uh, much, but they're probably part of that same continuum. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Curtis? Um, I've got one. I don't know how to raise my hand electronically. Uh, Curtis, any idea about the mechanism in which the magmas interact with the crust at that sort of shallow intermediate level to acquire an oxidation state and the go where's the gold from? That's a great question. Um, yeah, the, so we didn't do much or any isotopic work outside of age dating. Uh, it would have been nice to have done that, uh, especially oxygen isotopes and zircon, but uh, Funding constrained. It's quite expensive to do that work. Um, likely, it seems assimilation is the most uh, reasonable mechanism. There's some work on more mafic melts from Norilsk uh, where it demonstrates just uh, organic carbon. You don't need much. 0.1% can reduce by up to two log units. So uh, theoretically, you don't need a lot. But yeah, that, that is a weak point in what you know, what we're presenting, there just isn't, we don't have the isotopic data to support that. So that's uh, an opportunity for future work. In terms of where the gold comes from, uh, the endowments of the Carlin trend, you can generate from a couple hundred cubic kilometers. Uh, so Bingham, for example, is roughly 750 cubic kilometers is what's been calculated for the source of the endowment there. Um, so you, just with background, you know, two to five PPB gold concentrations in melt, you can do that. Uh, but if you assimilate a, a bunch of carbonaceous rock, that's probably higher gold content than the melt. Uh, potentially, you're going to add gold to the melt there. Uh, so maybe that's part of the story. But I don't think we have any data to really uh, talk much about that. I don't see how to raise my hand either, Curtis. This is uh, Chris Dale. Um, would you mind uh, speculating a little bit? Uh, you've got this great story for, for uh, Nevada and Utah, uh, gold on one side and copper on the other, and the transition in between. How that model might apply in Idaho and Montana, where you've got whatever you want to call it, a bunch of gold deposits in Idaho, and then big porphyries in Butte, and then maybe how that might extend into uh, Central Washington and maybe Northeast uh, Washington and Northern Ireland to BC. Yeah, well, that's my favorite topic. I'm glad you asked about that. Um, uh, the Bronco Creek guys have heard a lot about this Idaho story of late. Um, yeah, I think it's the same. I, I think uh, I, I know the Idaho portion better just because I've been focused on that from an exploration standpoint for a while. I haven't done a lot of work in Montana, so. I can't really comment too much on that, but uh, or BC as well. But in Idaho, it's especially East Central Idaho, where it's the same passive margin sedimentary sequence that gets significantly more reducing and thicker as you move west. 
And you, I mean, you know, your neck of the woods, Stib Knight in particular, likely there were black shales at present depth or at depth there prior to intrusion of both Cretaceous and Eocene magmatism. So if you look at the Sun Valley district uh, in that region, the Haley Gold Belt, uh, it's there's almost for sure carlin type deposits in that area. There are some that have been found. But geopolitically, it's a little bit tough to do any work there, but it seems like it's the same mechanism. The, there's not any good oxidation state data on the Eocene intrusions, but if you just look at metal associations from things in uh, the eastern part of that region, uh, it looks like typical porphyry systems. Uh, they're copper rich with boronite, magnetite scarns, things like that. As you move west, it's dominated by tin tungsten, gold arsenic antimony uh, in scarns and various other styles. So uh, I think that's uh, probably an important uh, mechanism that's in place up there. But again, Montana and British Columbia, I'm just not as familiar with, so don't have a lot to say there. It's like Matt Fithian. Go for it, Matt. Hey, Curtis, uh, great job. Um, I wanted to refer back to one of your earlier slides where you showed the relative temperatures of formation from, from high to low throughout Nevada. Um, I want to get your thoughts on why it seems that the majority of the high temperature deposits are in the upper plate of the Roberts Mountain Thrust and then how that plays into your exploration model. Oh, that's a good question. Um, think about that. I'm not sure if I have a good answer for why they're in the upper plate. Uh, I think it just depends on what parts of the crust are exposed and where the magma is docked. I'm, I'm sure there are places where the higher temperature styles would be found in lower plate. Um, uh, I'd have to give that some more thought, honestly. Uh, I don't have a great off the cuff answer to that and how it would play into it. Um, I think getting an idea of what level you're in the crust, just in general, depending on which range you're in or which part of which range, uh, would be an important first step in sorting that out. But I don't know if there is an upper plate versus lower plate control on uh, different uh, styles of, uh, I guess, different temperatures of mineralization. But yeah, again, I, I have to give that some thought. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is David John. I can't figure out how to um, <laughs> Hi, David. raise my hand. Hi, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I had two questions. One's um, specifically about the Battle Mountain District, um, and the other's more regional. Do you think the, um, any of the porphyries or the, or the Copper Canyon stock Venet, or do you have enough preservation of the paleo surface you can say there, were, there weren't volcanic rocks? Uh, associated with the, the magnetism there? Uh, it's funny, Mike Russell and I were just talking about this recently. Um, there's, I think there's a reasonable chance the Copper Canyon stock been in. It's, uh, it's probably at current levels a, a kilometer. I mean, it's about 750 meters below the Tuff of Cove mine, uh, if you reconstruct the district. Okay. Um, and that's, you know, it's roughly four to five million years of erosion between there. So however much you want to take off, you could remove a decent amount. Uh, but also in the center of the Copper Canyon stock, there's a, a giant breccia pipe zone uh, within there that could be uh, some sort of volcanic neck. Uh, it's a total speculation, but uh, I don't know. That, that's a great question. Uh, maybe there's just not enough uh, remaining 39 MA paleo surface in the Battle Mountain to know, uh, but it seems reasonable to me that some of it would have been in. Yeah, I don't think there are any volcanic rocks of that age exposed anywhere nearby. No, I think like 34 and a half to 35 or the, the Tuff of Cove yeah, mine is pretty much it. Um, the other question is, uh, you mentioned that the Eocene magmas were particularly fertile across the Great Basin. Uh, do you think there were any significant epithermal deposits? Mm, in the the Aurora is about the only one I'm aware of, and that's pretty small. Yeah, um, maybe that, that's, a, I guess, an important part of that is the preservation level. Um, 
hard to say. There was a lot of fluid flow. I can imagine that some of that would have been channeled into different rocks and it would have manifested as different styles, more epithermal style. Uh, be my sort of feel on that. But I don't know, what do you think about that? Um, having written a short paper for GSN, which I guess will come out this summer, we sort of, Chris Henry and I speculated about that and, and basically decided that we, we it seems like the, the Eocene rocks that are preserved, are, there's not a lot of evidence for venting. And um, just, we don't see any epithermal deposits and certainly not been preserved. And, and there's I don't think a lot of evidence that there were significant deposits. So it's, it's not a very good answer, but <laughs> we couldn't find, you know, good evidence for them. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because as soon as you get younger than about 34, the amount of venting increases dramatically. Uh, similar yeah, you get the nimbrite flare-up. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it, a lot more epidermal deposits. So maybe that's an uh, important part of the story as well. Yeah. Anyway, great talk. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Any other questions for Curtis? Okay, well, I think we're done. Um, Curtis, I just want to say thanks very much. That was a fantastic talk, as others have, have mentioned. And um, I think now uh, Curtis's committee and Curtis will move into uh, another defense phase where uh, uh, he'll have to uh, answer more questions. Um, but I want to thank all that attended. This was a fantastic turnout. We appreciate uh, all of you. Uh, showing up. And um, if you're interested in Curtis's presentation, um, you can either email me at mwrestel at unr.edu or Curtis directly. Um, and I think you have Curtis's email from uh, the uh, meeting announcement. So take care, everyone. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll see you later. Great job, Thank Curtis. You very much. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thanks, Curtis, and thanks, Mike, for arranging the Zoom format. Somehow it worked. Thank you. <laughs> Good yeah, job, well, Kurt. Well done, Curtis. Great Thank job, you. Curtis. Thanks much. Thanks for oh,